think many of you know Dewey, the executive director of the St. George Botanical Gardens. And this is a before picture, isn't it? It is, <laughs> yes. Yes, I was asked, besides giving the, giving the talk, to also give a little update on the garden. So I'm going to start out with that because I'm probably going to overshoot the time and I will never have time to do it at the okay, end. <laughs> Thank you. Are you going to be timekeeper? I'll be time. That's, that's <laughs> excellent. <laughs> well, do you want me to get started? Are you all yeah, set? Okay. Go ahead. Well, let me first thank the friends, and I'm so excited to be here, and it's been quite the wait, because this talk was going to happen uh, in September of last year, and we had a little thing called Irma that happened, and it was supposed to happen, I think it was that week after Irma happened, and of course we didn't know about Maria at the time. So <laughs> the final analysis was it got delayed. So <laughs> <laughs> so here we are in May, and so I can actually talk about a fair amount of this. And, and given your schedule of things that are coming up, I'm going to be touching on some of those topics tonight as we're looking at that. So let me first give you the update on the Botanical Garden, and I will also put a plug in. If anyone wants to volunteer out the Botanical Garden, please let me know. But at any rate, obviously uh, we had two Category 5, or if you want to make the argument for six, Category 6, uh, hurricanes yeah, just about two weeks to the day and you know when you ask everybody well what was your damage everybody will have various things to tell you but the answer is always but man everything outside was just smashed well being a botanical garden everything was pretty much outside <laughs> so needless to say it was a mess so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit but the nice thing is recovery is well underway for us as it is for everybody and I would just first of all would like to say thank you to everybody who has helped us and has helped you know, pick up things and helped us with all kinds of different things and also just helped hold our hands. Uh, it has been very much appreciated. Now this is going to go the old fashioned way. I'm going to push the button. So this was taken the day before Maria uh, looking down the, uh, down the uh, Palm Drive at the Botanical Garden. You can see it lined with our lovely Puerto Rican royal palms, uh, native to the island. And um, I had a feeling it wouldn't look like that afterwards. So for those of you who haven't seen the after picture, um, this is what it looked like looking exactly that same view 10 days later. Why 10 days later? Because I couldn't get to the garden for 10 days. Uh, I live in the east, and I literally could not get there for about 10 days. You just sort of imagine what you're looking at here. But at any rate, so th this was 10 days later. Um, there was a period in November, and we just had to arbitrarily decide when we were going to reopen the garden. We said, you know what, nobody's going to be there, but we're going to open it in November. It gives us a target. So in November, we did reopen, uh, particularly right around the, the visitor center. We could clean that up first. It was safer. Um, but eventually, we got really going. So in November, actually, it was when we had a lot of volunteers suddenly came out and were able to really help us. And we had a couple of, of weeks, and this is not the only time, but a couple of weeks in November where we had over 70 giant, enormous industrial dump truck loads of debris leave in two weeks' time. And that was just one little two-week period. Now, it was the highest period of debris leaving, but debris leave was leaving for months. But that was the biggest period. Plus, we had a lot of debris hauled out in between Irma and Maria. So there was a lot of that. But I'm happy to show you the next slide, which is, uh, hang on a second, there. So this was taken just a few weeks ago uh, at our Echo Fair, and uh, this was St. Croix Environmental, and uh, the, we partner with them for this fair. And here we go, we've got kids learning all about hula hooping and other things. So you can see the garden ha is very green at this point, and a lot of things are growing back. And I will tell you that from the standpoint of FEMA, FEMA classifies botanical gardens and museums under the class, same classification. I would tell you also that we're a little better off than museums because when something smashes up a museum's collection, it doesn't grow back. In our case, um, where there were no leaves before, it does grow back. <laughs> and so if you can just clean the debris. Now what you can't see with the lights on is that there's a lot of bare dirt in here. Every place you see bare dirt at the, at the Botanical Garden is because there were giant mountains of debris sitting on it for months at a time before it could be hauled off. So it, we're still going through the process, but life has returned. 
And I hope everybody comes out and sees us at the garden if you haven't. The nursery is open on Tuesdays, so be sure and come out and buy your plants. And uh, everything is pretty much uh, uh, up and running normally. So, and also think Mango Melee. Uh, that's coming up in July. We'll be on time. And uh, we should be, uh, I'm hoping, the island's first big full-scale event. And we've already had, thanks to the Friends of Denmark, we had Transfer Day at the Botanical Garden. Uh, we just had the Orchid Society's Orchid Show. And uh, we had, of course, Echo Fair. We've had many other things happening. So please come out, and we hope to see you there. So now on with our present business. So waiting till September for <laughs> History Through Plants, Environmental Changes on St. Croix. And I think the thing I would say is we're surrounded by plants every day. But we don't stop to think about the stories that they're actually telling us. And so I think that it's worth hearing the plants and also thinking about the stories that they're telling us about our past and also about our potential future. So let's look at that a little bit here. So here's sort of our starting point, which is pre-human pre St. Croix, which I have not visited. But, but this is going to have to stand in for that. Uh, this is a pre-Maria shot in one of the guts above Christianstead. Uh, and it is showing a, a beautiful guava berry forest amongst lots of other native Eugenias and other native trees. Uh, so you're seeing pretty much 100% natives up there, at least in this shot. And um, at least somewhat, but close enough. But it gives you the idea of the dense forest that would have covered the island pretty much all the way from the dry end all the way to the wetter end of the island. Because if you think about enough, enough millennia going by, uh, forests were able to form a canopy pretty much over the entire island. There were certainly exceptions, but you had the driest forest, obviously, at the east end, and tropical moist forest at the far northwest part of the island. And this is a good example of how dark it is and dense it is, even in a somewhat shorter forest like this is. And we're an island. So being an island, we have endemics and things that are found nowhere else in the world. This is a shot in the wild of a Jamaican caper tree. Um, and this is our Crucian genetic sort. The Jamaican caper is native throughout the Caribbean basin. But we have our own unique set of genetics because we're an isolated island. Unlike the northern Virgin Islands that are really greater Antillean and part of Puerto Rico, uh, and sometimes connected by dry land to Puerto Rico, we are an oceanic island, maybe more similar to Barbados. So really, the line between the greater and lesser Antilles kind of is between us and the northern Virgin Islands. So we are isolated and have been very isolated through geologic time. So here's a plant that's telling us a little funny story. This, this plant right here, notice the different leaves that it has on it? These are mature leaves at the top. These are juvenile leaves at the bottom. If this thing were out in the sunshine, those bottom leaves would almost be brown looking. The plant is trying to make itself look like something that it is not in its juvenile phase. It goes over to the mature leaves somewhere in about here to here, typically. So what the tree may be telling us is it was trying to fool some animal that is no longer here. Uh, and what that was, I, I don't know. Whether it was a big ground iguana or a big tortoise or something that probably went into cook pots early on and is no longer on the island, but the tree's expecting them. It still thinks that they're going to be around. So you can look at some of the plants and they're telling you about things pre-human that are no longer around. Um, you can think about uh, our native parrots that would have been here that are no longer around. Remains of a macaw has been found on the island and there would have been other parrots undoubtedly here. Uh, there have been quite a few animals. There may have been flightless birds. There may have been quite a few things that were on the island before the first human beings got here. And then, of course, being an island, an oceanic island at that, we have endemics, plants that are found nowhere else on the planet other than this island. So this is our, our very well-known St. Croix century plant. The St. Croix century plant does not take a century to bloom. <laughs> Give or take, what do you think, Olassie, about 20 years? give or take, some, something like that. But it seems like a century if you're a gardener waiting for it. But at any rate, it's native just here. Um, so this agave species, of which there are many agave species, many of them from uh, Central America and Mexico, but this one's native just to this island. 
So here's a plant that's found nowhere else in the world. And let me show you its flower. There's the flower of the St. Croix century plant. So if you wait that 20 years, there it is. This was one that was in front of the botanical garden when it went into flower. As you all know, when the century plant blooms, it flowers and it dies. Now, what's interesting to me is that the St. Croix century plant has never been known particularly to set seed. What it seems to do is clone itself through a little structures called bulbils, which are little baby plants that are exact copies of the mother plant that form all up and down the flowering stalk after the flowers are finished. And when it falls over, the little ones fall off, they can root in. And, but for a federally endangered species, this one is actually relatively common in the gardens of St. Croix. Because what happens if you have one in your yard and it falls over with like a thousand babies on it? You know, you probably only need two or three to replant, right, in your yard. So what do you do? You give them around. So in gardens for endangered species, it's fairly well represented, but particularly here on St. Croix. It's not so well re represented in other islands. And this is a picture of our mint gut today. Everybody's familiar with the word gut, which I, being an Ohio boy originally, I would have first said a creek. But here it's gut. As I understand it, it comes from a Danish word meaning a seasonal stream, which is certainly the case. Mint gut typically is a seasonal stream. Sometimes it's dry, sometimes a little water going down it. This is what Maria did for us. Maria decided to take the canopy out, put the sun in, put in a pond, and latent water lilies came up, and we have this Monet garden that we did nothing to get. <laughs> it's just there. And however long it lasts, I don't know. Depends on the water table of the island. It's declined by about a foot since, since its highest point right now. So I'm hoping for some rain to sustain it a little bit more because it's really lovely. But I put it in here to, to illustrate a point, And that is when the first settlers from South America arrived uh, several thousand years ago on this island, they picked places to settle where they could use their canoes to get to the coast and where they had a good supply of constant fresh water. Mint gut is one of the largest natural drainages on St. Croix. And at that time, several thousand years ago, when the forest, remember that primitive island covered with dense forest from one side to the other? At that time, uh, these guts ran from our botanical garden all the way down to the south coast, navigably by canoe. So you're talking miles uh, by canoe. And it was running like that 365 days a year. So I show you this to think about the amount of water, not water lily filled, but water that would have been flowing down through there. They settled several thousand years ago at the site of the Botanical Garden uh, and other sites around the island because they could sail to the coast from there and they had plenty of fresh water. And we, have the, we are finding our, uh, remains from that village, which was probably on our site for at least a thousand years. So you have to think about the first humans coming a long time before the Europeans and the first changes to the island occurring at that time. And here's a fruit I think everybody will recognize as soursop. And there's a debate on the island as to where exactly the plant may have come from, but a fair number of people believe it may well have been introduced to the island as early as the initial settlers from South America. And I want to mention that because I think the Polynesians have had really good public relations people. And so everybody knows about the ancient voyaging Polynesian folks loading up their, their voyaging canoes with the plants that they wanted to take to their newest home where they were going to settle. But we don't think about the folks coming from South America doing exactly the same thing with the plants that they were going to use in their new world that they were traveling to. So the soursop is very likely one of those. It's very popular on the island today but it's been here for several thousand years, if that's true. Here's another plant that is in that group of we think they brought it in. Uh, this is anato. How many people have, 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 have seen anato as a food coloring? It's an organic food coloring? Yeah, because it's a natural food coloring. Uh, the anato plant, Bixia orellana, is native to the Amazon basin and was eventually traveled with the canoe to the islands. We keep them cut as bush form. And the reason for that is in the Amazon, they become small trees, but it's not wet enough consistently on the island for them to be like that. Now, maybe when they first got here several thousand years ago, it was. But the island has been drying, and I'll talk about that later. But because of that, they get weak, and we cut them back and rejuvenate them. And this was sometimes called the lipstick plant because, and you really can't see them at all with this because, again, of the lights. But there are seeds in the pod here that are bright orange. 
and those seeds have a food colorant on, on the, or a colorant on it that is used for the food coloring. So in order to make margarine look like butter, this was the coloring that was used initially. And you'll see annatto in organic foods a lot. It was brought here as a, as a body paint uh, plant. We use for ceremonial purposes, but today, you know, little girls on the island might use it to, to put on some lipstick or other per possible purposes. Flowers are gorgeous on the plant, but it's again probably a long time plant on the island. Again, a little bit of debate about its origin. Yes, go ahead. Oh, there you go. So, the, the, see, and Lassie would know all this. Right. Perfect. Perfect. So, so thank you for that the, for that extra detail. And Lassie, of course, knows everything about this. So, I'm glad to have him today. But anyway, I'm going to show you this. This is our, from our West Indian uh, garden on, at the Botanical Garden. And it's a food garden, but I want to point out a couple of plants in particular. The first is this one, which is cassava. And cassava, again, a South American plant. It is one of the prime food plants from people in the Amazon region. It's now grown throughout the tropical world. Uh, and we have it in the garden here. Think of tapioca. Uh, it's locally referred to as yuca and the plant is a wonderful source of starch. And so it would have been brought in at that time. The other little friend here, down there, is sweet potato, which is also a South American plant rel related to the morning glory. And uh, so some of these tubers and things were brought in, uh, or, or cuttings were brought in, again, for their gardens, and we still have them today. Now, they haven't gone feral on the island. They continue to have to be replanted by people, and they have been. But this plant that they, at least we believe, that they probably brought to the island. What do you think, Olassi? Yeah. 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 This, is, this is Ganip. I think everybody recognizes Ganip from every, all of your yards and everywhere on the island. So originally, the Native Americans would have used this plant not only for the fruit, they also would have eaten the seeds. And you can imagine, again, OK, they've opened up villages, and they've opened up some agricultural land. But generally, the island is still forested. So the ganip, which likes disturbance, um, was probably a fairly well-behaved plant just around the perimeters of where they have disturbed it. Um, and it wasn't reproducing hugely, probably, because a lot of the seeds were being eaten. Eventually, though, people would come to the island that weren't interested in eating the seeds and would do a lot more disturbance. And so this plant's been here for thousands of years, but it really had, a few hundred years ago, had a big change in its existence and ours. I just wanted to add, yeah. the, one of the reasons why the brought there is the seeds that they use, is that the, the men, the, the Indians, they tie the seeds around the waist, and to be the food for them to use spirit, but also because the food stays in the clothes. So what they did, they make a watery substance and sprinkle the woman body, and she said it's a gas part. <laughs> and, and, I, and I love that. And it also in, illustrates a rather interesting point, and that is a lot of, uh, of, of plants that were originally brought in had this sort of woven together cultural and food value. So you can't separate the two necessarily. I mean, they have multiple reasons for being brought in. And this is another plant that kind of falls into this category that's been debated over, over the years about whether Native Americans brought the, our friend the spiny penguin in from South America or whether it would have been native in parts of the Caribbean. I don't know if the jury is in on that. Lassie, have you heard anything on that, on the penguin? It, it was brought from a, a Native American area. Yeah. That's what I had heard, too, was they used this as barbed wire fencing, essentially, around the village, which the pineapple, which they also brought in, was used sort of to illustrate the entrance to the village, where they wanted people coming in and out. Um, Europeans took that as a sign of hospitality. 
I'm not sure that the locals meant it to be hospitable, but they're really kind of saying, here's the front door. And it's one of the few cases where European culture decided to adopt something from an indigenous culture, which is why you have pineapple-shaped door knockers and, and lamp posts uh, and finials today throughout the European-influenced world. Uh, but that happened here in the Caribbean. The pineapple itself was brought fully born as the big horticultural seedless plant that we know. The natives brought that with them. It had bred, been bred thousands of years earlier in Brazil, again, by local people there. So again, the Europeans came in and discovered a plant that had been being developed horticulturally for thousands of years by other people <laughs> and uh, claimed it for, for, for they, they were the first to see it. But this one, you know, and I will say this about my penguins. I have to tell a funny story on this. Where, where my house is on the island, uh, there, 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 was, there is a patch of wild penguins in there and, or I guess we should say feral penguins since, this, since the plant uh, was brought in. Uh, one night after looking at the property, I went back to my family where we were gonna build the house and said, well, everything looks great. And there's a really big penguin colony in there. And they're like, what? <laughs> penguin colony? What are you talking about? So this is Bromelia penguin, and <laughs> the botanical name, spelled a little different than the bird. But at any rate, it is a terrestrial bromeliad related to the pineapple. It produces a cluster of small fruits. It tastes something like pineapple if you actually want to get through all the fiber to eat them. Uh, I find my plants hardly ever make any fruit, but there you go. So here's a native tree that I just want to sort of mention because we're on the cusp of talking about the European influence. So at this point, we've seen parts of the island cleared, but in small ways uh, by Native Americans doing their farming, their villages, their things. They may have cut trees for canoes in the forest. They may have done other things. But generally, we still have a pretty good forest cover. This is a, a young seedling of Caneal, wild cinnamon, which is native through this part of the Caribbean. It's now a relatively rare tree. And there's a reason why it's relatively rare. Uh, and that is because when Europeans first got here, and I think the, there's a tendency to think the Europeans first came here and cleared a bunch of land and planted a bunch of sugarcane. And that happened on a few islands but not on most islands. Most islands, they did a few other things prior to sugarcane. One of the things they did was look for spice substitutes. Because back in the, in the day, you know, these kind of things were the money spinners. Spices were money spinners. Fiber and dye were money spinners. Uh, salt was money spinners. So these were all things that happened in the Caribbean before sugar really took hold. And this tree, unfortunately, is not related at all to true cinnamon from Southeast Asia. And as such, in order to make it taste like cinnamon, you have to remove the inner bark, which kills the tree. Now, like many members of the dry Caribbean forest, it's a relatively slow growing tree. So when you cut them down and peel their bark off and kill them and sell that cinnamon substitute, you're probably not gonna get a lot of replacement of that plant, but it's making money for you initially. So initially, people are running around cutting these trees down as they find them. Uh, Keneal Bay takes its name from Keneal, this plant here, uh, up on St. John. So at any rate, uh, this one actually happens to be in a yard that's undergoing reforestation. So I'm, I'm going to come back to this plant in, in a little bit later. But I just wanted to mention it to it because it really does speak to the interface between uh, the world before Europeans and the world after. So here we have cotton. And uh, here's another plant that has that somewhat debatable connection as to native or not, or whether it was brought in by, by Native Americans. I know, Lassie, what do you think about cotton? Brought in? Now, do you think if it was South American or the other way, from Yucatan? South. South, because there have been debates both ways. Uh, and you had native groups coming from Central America by way of Cuba and Hispaniola, and you had people coming up from South America through the Lesser Antilles and through the Virgins of Puerto Rico, kind of meeting each other at the Mona Passage between the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Trading is going on, so certain things could have been traded across. Um, we're not sure exactly what those might have been, but cotton has pretty much been felt now has been brought into the Caribbean. But by the time the Europeans came, it was well established in the islands. What most people from North America don't realize is that cotton is actually a small woody tree or a really big woody bush, depending on your you know, glass half full, glass half empty kind of perspective. But originally, it was uh, harvested as an orchard crop. So 
I remember as a third grader getting my geography book and it had a print of a woodcut in there showing people harvesting cotton with poles with the caption underneath that read, uh, see how much Europeans didn't know about life in the New World. They thought cotton grew on trees. Well, actually, the guy who wrote the book didn't know that much about the New World because it does grow on a tree. It's just, it's just that various varieties of cotton have been bred together to give us the ancestors of today's field cotton, uh, the most famous of which is Sea Island cotton. And those are the cottons that you can grow in one growing season uh, where you have a winter. Now, you have to be, have a big, long growing season uh, to do it. Although, I am from southern Ohio, and I'm here to tell you cotton was grown in southern Ohio. That's because if you were a settler in the Ohio wilderness, you did not have a Target store to go to to get your, your cotton clothing, and you need to grow a little bit out back in order to have cotton. So even that far north, cotton could be grown. It wasn't profitable, but as a subsistence crop, as a crop for that family, it could be grown. It's a big field crop in the south. So here, woody tree, now feral. And what's interesting is I always wondered, how does this, why does this thing do this? I mean, all, if you ever see these things, the cotton just falls on the ground. I mean, it's like, why would any plant want to do that? Turns out the cotton is a fabulous uh, bird nest making material. It counts on the birds to move it to the nests all over the island. And then once the bird's nest is done and it falls on the ground, then if the seeds get down in there and, and the, the, the cotton then will hold water against those seeds if we have a long enough rainy period, and only if it's long enough, then they'll germinate and make the new plant. So it's a pr it gets it where it's going and it protects it, makes sure it doesn't germinate with a little shower in a dry period. So it's interesting about cotton, but again, a, a plant brought to our area by uh, other people. But now here's a plant that's strictly brought here by Europeans. So now the Europeans are here and they're starting to clear land. And they're looking at those money spinners I was talking about. So this is indigo. Uh, indigo we have at the Botanic Garden. This, I took this picture at the Botanical Garden. Uh, and it reseeds itself rather readily, but it was brought in initially from India for the famous blue dye, made famous to Americans by blue jeans. Uh, it's, that's the color of indigo originally. It comes from the leaves. The leaves have to be steeped in water, and there's a whole procedure around getting indigo paste out of that, which I will not bore you with unless you want to know the formula. But at any rate, this plant was one of the early plants because, again, dye and fiber. One of the big money spinners early on. Now here's a cactus. And this is in our dye and fiber garden, actually pre-Maria, although it actually looks the same today. Uh, but why, why you would say do we have a cactus in here? This is a nopal cactus, which is native to Mexico. And you're thinking, okay, so why would they be planting cactus here? And the reason is because of a cactus pest. In Mexico, there's a little scale insect that infests the nopal cactus. Now you would think, that's bad. As a gardener, I would say bad, you know? However, when the conquistadors got to Mexico and went to Tenochtitlan, which at that time, you know, the capital of the Aztecs, which was the largest city in the world at the time, um, and they got in there, they saw the amazing scarlet dyed clothing, and they're like, oh my God. I mean, this, this would be a fortune in Europe. I mean, red dyes were incredibly important. Turns out that little scale bug if you crush it up, makes the finest red dye, natural red dye, in the world. And it's called cochineal. And cochineal dye was the, ruled the red dye market until synthetic dyes eventually came onto the, onto the scene. So they, they brought this cactus and its bugs into the Caribbean. They worked here. So that was, that was okay. You could harvest cochineal in the Caribbean. Maybe not quite as well as parts of Mexico, particularly Oaxaca is the main homeland for cochineal but it did okay in the Caribbean. So they said, you know what? Let's take it all over the world. So they took the cactus and other cactus like it all over the world, and the cactus really enjoyed the Mediterranean, the Middle East, South Africa, Australia, Hawaii. They liked a lot of places, uh, but the bug, not so much. <laughs> so now these cactus have gone feral all over the world and are a terrible invasive species elsewhere. But the bug didn't like anywhere outside of this, the Americas other than the Canary Islands. It did so well on the Canary Islands, though, it eventually eclipsed all the red dye coming out of the Americas eventually, just in time to be completely undone by synthetic dyes. So, so it goes. But hence the cactus. This, of course, is sugarcane. Sugarcane is a hybrid plant. 
originally it comes from several different species in Southeast Asia, Southern Asia and Southeast Asia, India and areas like Borneo and those areas. And when they've been bred together in different forms and different races, uh, you have the sugar canes that we know today, which continue to be developed. Uh, well, a couple of interesting facts about sugar cane that are horrible uh, <laughs> is that sugar cane it, it produces the highest sugar content of about any natural plant that is, has commercial properties to it. The sugar content is highest the lower you go on the stem. So if you picture these poor people having to cut this stuff by hand, they, the overseers would have made sure that they cut it right at the ground because that's where the sweetest stuff is at the lower part of the cane. So there was no way he was going to let you do this. You're doing this and all day long in the, in the hot sun. And it's not, definitely not easy work. Even today, in certain parts of Central America, like uh, Nicaragua, for example, uh, it's still cut by hand. The reason it's cut by hand today, unlike in Brazil and other places where it's automated harvesting, uh, or mechanical harvesting, I should say, is because it's a make-work program. There are too many people that don't have enough education to do any other work, and so if they automate or if they mechanize the, the harvest, they, will be, they won't have work. The problem with that is there's huge numbers of deaths in Central America right now to kidney failure, which is associated with dehydration, which is associated with being working in the cane fields. And what they don't want to say is it's probably also associated with insecticides. But that hasn't been proven yet, but there's forces trying not to prove that. So, uh, but we certainly would say that if you were here in the Caribbean cutting this cane by hand, it would not have been an easy task and your lifespan might not have been super long. But at any rate, the plant came particularly by way of the Spanish. They had already been growing the plant in the Atlantic Islands and in some parts of the Mediterranean. It had originally come down from India through trade routes. Uh, so they knew about sugarcane growing in the Old World and in the Mediterranean world before they came to Americas. <coughs> and there's a story, I don't know if it's true or not, that Columbus was visiting relatives in Madeira where, and they were growing sugarcane. And when he saw the sea beans and things floating in from the west and thought there must be land to the west. Like all sailors of his time, he knew where the currents were he also knew the world was round. I mean, they didn't think they were going to really fall off. In fact, the Greeks, thousands of years before, had worked out the, pretty much the diameter of the sphere that the world is. But at any rate, so sugarcane, old world plant, comes in and revolutionizes the Caribbean world. But then after crops come in, then horticultural plants begin to arrive in the island. Now keep in mind, the islands are being cleared and cleared and cleared and cleared for all these plants as time is going on very rapidly. There were European groups that felt that they felt <laughs> that miasmas and other kinds of disease carrying issues were happening in forests. So if you could cut down forests, you would eliminate uh, a lot of the diseases that were causing problems with the Europeans. It also gave a really good excuse why you might want to cut a lot of stuff and sell the logs. Uh, for wood. So that all worked handily together. But deforestation is going on very rapidly as Europeans are doing this. But horticultural plants start to show up. This is noni from the South Pacific, known locally as the painkiller tree. Uh, it is known that because it is used for that. A lot of people will, will go ahead and use leaves uh, act literally wrapped around joints, arthritic joints, using the noni oil to rub on the skin to alleviate pain. What are some other uses, would you say, for noni? Uh, they use it for headache, but locally, if they have a pain, they will eat, they leave all the fire, and what it does, they manipulate the leaves to activate, then they will add lard, which is from swine, and then they rub it, and they tighten in the joint, and tighten the head, so what happens when I have a headache, it's tighter, it leaves them totally black. It's in code, that's what they name, uh, painkiller, and the other name right. was Starbucks in Afro, because during it, 'd you not say that this fruit is not the best tasting fruit in the world no, no, it's no. horrible <laughs> 
Yeah, 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 exactly. But it's interesting, he talks about the, the starvation fact of it, because that goes way back in this plant's history. And one of the things that fascinates me about this versus human culture, and that is this is really from Polynesian Southeast Asia originally, and eventually was brought by Europeans later to the Caribbean. But in Polynesia, it was considered a starvation fruit, just as he was saying. And so he wouldn't love to eat it. I mean, it smells like rotten cheese and it's sticky like glue. But hey, if you're starving, it's food. But the thing about that is, uh, why would the Polynesians have taken it around with them? They had, were sailors. A sailing culture a, with sails has a big fear. And what's the big fear that you would guess sailors would be worried about as they're sailing out into the unknown? Anybody want to guess? Sinking, running out of water, what else? Food, no wind. How about being marooned? So being marooned on an uninhabited <laughs> island without enough resources to keep body and soul together was a major issue. And I love the fact that the Europeans and the Polynesians, who had no contact with each other for a long period of time, developed this idea, we need to leave stuff even on the islands where we're not going to live, just in case one of us ever gets wrecked there so that they have something to eat. So the Europeans are chucking, uh, chucking goats ashore on islands that they're not going to actually settle. And the Polynesians are doing the same with the noni, because the noni will grow anywhere. It'll grow in beach sand right at the high tide mark and, and all the way to the understory of the rainforest and everything in between. And so it would keep your body and soul together if you were marooned, just like the goats will. But two totally different cultures, two united by the same fear, two different solutions, but this is a plant that came to the island. Now this is very hard to see, so I'm not going to oh, belabor it, but this is the, the flower of the tamarind tree, which is originally from Africa and India, and here it is again. These are the tamarind pods that you see on the ground, and you can see the little seedlings popping up. And I want to use this to illustrate the fact that just because a plant isn't from a place doesn't mean it can't like that place a lot. Just like the ganips did, the tamarinds like it. Now what keeps tamarinds from going feral everywhere on the island? Primarily, they don't have a good distributing agent for their seeds. Typically what happens is what's happening here. The seeds fall right under the tree, the little babies germinate, and they get shaded to death by the mother tree. So it needs somebody like a human being to carry it around, eat the pulp, throw the seed, and then get a tamarind tree coming up. Tamarinds love us, but they don't travel well. Um, Alassie, would you say cattle would spread tamarinds? Yes. See, I would think so. Bats sometimes will, will spread them, because you'll see a tamarind tree, oddly enough, coming up here and there. But they, they yeah, go ahead. So did you say they're from India? To Africa? India to Africa. Africa. Yeah, Africa. yeah. So what, what animals spread it in those countries? Well, there they have so many things like eland and gazelles and <laughs> just hooved mammals that are going to be eating it and spreading it around uh, that you've got a huge plethora. In the Botanic Garden, we have a tree called the sausage tree. It's from Africa, a terrible woody sausage-shaped fruit. And we get no seedlings out of that unless we pry the seed out and actually treat it. And the reason is because the only animals that eat it are elephants and rhinos. And it has to pass through and come out in their dung before the seeds will germinate. So we just don't find a lot of seedlings in the garden <laughs> for that reason. you know. So eventually, St. Croix ends up with with a woodland that looks something like this. This is, of course, primarily our old friend, uh, Tantan. Now, Tantan was brought in as a cattle forage and an animal forage. Um, it's not so good for horses and horse relatives. If they eat more than 30 to 40 percent of their diet on Tantan, they start losing their hair, like their manes, their tails, stuff falling off. So it's not so good for them. Cattle don't seem to have a big problem with it. And it was, it was brought in as a forage plant. But with the removal of the forests, and then with suddenly the, be the beginning of the end of sugarcane production, hugely, uh, Tantan begins to spread across the landscape. Now, St. Croix has a difference to the other Virgin Islands, and that is we have a lot of relatively flat land. That made us agriculture center for this whole area of islands. So we were intensively cropped, intensively. So only the very tops of the hills escaped a whole heck of a lot of growing uh, of crops. So the t as the decline of sugar happened, does everybody know why sugar declined? Anybody know? Uh, 
It declined because of the sugar beet. The sugar beet, which will grow in cold climates like Europe, they process for getting sugar out of them commercially, was developed after, after the Napoleonic Wars. D during the Napoleon's time, the other European countries were saying, you know what, this stinks. We can't get our sugar out of the tropics anymore. All this war stuff, what else can we do? And they eventually developed the process that we get sugar out of sugar beets. The sugar beets can be grown right there where the big markets are. And so the price begins to drop. And these big giant plantations in the tropics really could not competitively compete in, in a price dropping situation. Um, so slowly but surely, tamarind, or the, the uh, tantan is taking over. Another plant you'll notice in this picture, there's two other plants of significance. Everybody recognize this plant? Mother-in-law's Mother tongue, exactly. Sansevieria from Africa. Does anybody know the other more mercantile name for the plant? Bowstring hemp. And therein lies a clue as to why it was brought to the Caribbean. Again, it's a fiber plant. So back in those fiber days, that plant was brought in, and it's used to make cordage, ropes, things like that. One of those leaves can be made into a continuous strand uh, that you can then weave into, into ropes. The plant doesn't mind if it's in the shade, as we all know. It doesn't mind if it's in the sun, as we all know. It doesn't mind ruining ruins, which we found out in the botanic garden. <laughs> so it is a real comer. And it's really a pest in the understory and is a very problematic plant as far as plants getting regenerating. But the most problematic plant in this picture is the grass. And I think a lot of us from other parts of the world continental parts of the world, we think of grass as sort of, you know, who cares, it's grass. This is guinea grass. It's brought again as a forage uh, plant for animals uh, from Africa, and that plant is a problem. O islands typically do not have grass and fire habitats. They, they just don't. On con continents, you might have prairies and, uh, and, and, st and steppe lands where you'd have giant fires running across and you have a big grassland kind of situation. On islands, not so. But if you clear enough land and you get enough grass on an island, what suddenly happens? Fire. And fire and grass work together. So they change the entire environment for their own benefit. Grass use, uses fire to incinerate all of its competitors and take over the land. And the more grass there is, the more fire there is to incinerate any other competitors. So the, you can see the problem. Once the balance is tipped in favor of grass and fire, naive plants that have evolved on islands cannot begin to survive and compete. I remember my daughter and I visited the big island of Hawaii quite a few years ago, uh, more, more years than I'd like to say, but anyway. But we were on the, wet, on the dry side of the big island, and it was June, and there was nothing but helicopters flying big buckets of water, dropping them on bushfires. And those fires were started by alien grasses. And some of the most endangered species in Hawaii are caused by fire, because these plants have never seen fire. And it's the same in the Caribbean. Our plants are not fire adapted. And so this is a real problem when it comes down to it. But what's the best defense against Guinea grass? I just to yeah, go ahead. Yes. As compared to the that is very low. So very light, very high uh, pH, and the, you can do both plants if it fits nitrogen in the soil. That's right. To their benefit to them, right? So that's what is more um, open to the health. Which is an interesting point that he's making about the nitrogen fixation, and I want to come back to that. Um, right here you can see about a thousand baby tantans in this tiny little space germinating here. Here you can see the new little seed leaves right here. The seed is just popped open. You can see it just makes a carpet. And these seeds will lie dormant for years. So the, what we call a seed bank. Uh, and the seed banking of this species is quite impressive in sort of a horrifying kind of way. Here's a very large relative of Tantan. Uh, this is rain tree, sometimes called Saman. In Hawaii, it would be called monkey pod. It's a beautiful, gigantic dome-shaped tree. It's also been introduced to the island and not nearly as, as much of a pest uh, as Tantan is, but it was introduced again because of cattle. You think about it, once sugar is becoming uneconomical and these plantations are starting to get more and more involved with cattle, 
course, as you know, we developed the centipole cow here on St. Croix. Uh, it's our gift to the tropical world. Uh, but these cows don't like to sit in the tropical sun all day long. They need some kind of shade. Well, guess what? All the shade been cut off the island, right? At least where the cows were. So what do you do? You need a fast-growing shade tree. This was it from Venezuela, northern South America, this giant dome-shaped fast-growing tree. This is the beautiful flower that is on the tree. Uh, another plant that was brought in, not necessarily a super harmful plant, but again, another in, in semi-invasive species. And here's a newcomer on the invasive list. It's a little hard to see, but it's in silhouette there. This is neem, another plant from India. Neem is, is the source of neem oil, which is, of course, a, a natural insecticide. Notice I'm not saying a harmless insecticide. Natural products can be very, very, very toxic. Uh, and, and so Lassie made reference to uh, castor beans, obviously the source of ricin, which is one of the, uh, the most toxic substances known. Uh, but neem oil is, is, or neem oil is definitely not something I would want to consume, but it definitely is a natural insecticide sort of product. Loves the island, was brought in uh, not that many decades ago, and is slowly but surely taking over parts of the island. It's not as bad as some, but there are some issues with it. Now I wonder if you'd remember that tan tan forest that we saw a picture of. And we'll talk about that in a second. Here's another plant that tends to take over areas. This is Ginger Thomas. You can see it there in, in, growing next to the shower here. Uh, it grows over all over the island, uh, any place where, again, where there's disturbance. Considered to be an American native, the question is whether it's a Caribbean native. It is our uh, floral emblem, the, the Ginger Thomas, but it may actually not be native here. Uh, in fact, some people would say it's actually native to Central and South America and was brought in uh, early on during the European time. Hard to say. Uh, another plant that is a little mysterious in that way is white manjack, which you see here. Again, you see it all over the road signs of St. Croix. However, it doesn't seem to be nearly as prevalent in the northern Virgin Islands as it is on this island. Again, supposedly a native, but the question mark is around native to where? You know, whether it was native to all these islands or eventually it was brought in as, as, a, as an ornamental plant, etc. So again, these are two native plants, potentially, that act like invasives. You know, so a native plant can act like an invasive. Let's assume for argument's sake that they were native in small numbers on this island before Europeans got here. Why do you think they're all over the island today? What would be, what would be these are plants that are maybe adapted to what? What do you think? Disturbance? And what do humans do really well? Disturbance, right. So naturally they're symbolic plants for us because of that. So what does that leave us? It leaves us with an environment that is very much changed from the original starting point that we saw with that forest in the beginning. And here is a plant. This is a, a touch-me-not tree. I'm going to call it a tree. It's really a giant bush or small tree. And it is the other plant that is native only to St. Croix. It is also very endangered. But here's a plant that is probably never going to ever be in anybody's garden. It's called a touch-me-not plant for a reason. The underside of the foliage is like touching raw fiberglass. And it will stick into you just like that and burn and itch just like that. And this plant not only fell victim to its entire environment being cut down and changed, it also fell victim to actual persecution. This plant, as you can see, is rather innocuous looking. If you were cutting down some bush, would you actually even notice the plant? No, not until you're on fire you're not going to notice the plant. So when people would find the plant, even if it wasn't where they were going to cut it, they would assassinate it because they wanted to eliminate it completely. And they came close. But it still occurs in the wild. I've seen it in the wild in several places on the island. We are the stewards of this species of the botanical garden because nobody else is going to love it. And so we do reproduce it and we do grow it. Um, but plants like this that were cut for a reason, whether it's the wild cinnamon for commercial purposes or whether it was this plant because it was hated, they're now very rare plants and in need of somebody to look out for them. So where does that leave us? It also leaves us on a drying island. I had the, the
kind of ticklish situation. Maybe a year or so ago, I went out to lunch uh, with some donors for the botanical garden. And <clears throat> I knew they were from, uh, from a certain area of the country and a certain background that I thought might be a little bit touchy about climate change and the belief in such. And then they say to me, so do we. Do you believe in human-caused climate change? <laughs> like, ooh, I really don't want to talk about that, really, because I'm not sure what the right thing to say is. But what I decided to say was this. I said, well, I really believe in, in human-caused human local climate change. And I said, and I'm quite sure of, of that belief because it's well documented throughout literature that Europeans and other people around the world have been well aware that they could influence the climate, including the weather, in local areas and set out to specifically do so. And I gave the example. Remember early on I mentioned the money spinners? Salt being one of them. So if you were, say, the southern Bahamas or the Turks and Caicos, <clears throat> islands who really couldn't grow much of anything because it's rather dry there, but they were excellent at impounding seawater and evaporating it to leave salt. And that salt they would ship to Europe and they made quite a nice living being salt producers. What's the one thing that's going to be a bad thing if the ship's coming from Europe, you're getting ready to harvest the salt, here it comes, what bad thing could happen to you at that moment? Rain. So how do you stop errant rainfall? How do you think those Polynesians found distant islands? They, they did several things. They listened to the waves. They could tell the way the waves were moving the boats, that there was an island over the horizon. But if they saw clouds building up on the horizon, they knew it's probably building up over land. Well, those clouds can also produce rain. And that's a problem if you're in the Turks and Caicos. So what do you do? They knew what to do. They stripped the islands of the vegetation. They cut it all down. And they cut it down for one reason only, and that was to eliminate the rainfall. It worked very well. Today, those islands are very, very dry islands. Uh, and the salt harvest went on for many, many years. But on this island, by that time, by the time forests are being cleared here, Europeans were well aware of what deforestation would do to the island. But also, you have to remember, these people are every bit as clever and every bit as the same as we are today. And what did they say to themselves? That's somebody else's problem. You know, my kids can deal with it. My grandkids can deal with it. Or somebody else, I'm going to go back to Europe and live. Somebody else can deal with it. It doesn't really matter that this island is going to slowly dry out. So what's in the picture here? This is our native royal palm here. And um, when you, I want you to notice the two dead royal palm trunks right there. This was taken in 2015. Does anybody remember what was going on in 2015? Drought. One of our worst droughts in memorable history was happening in 2015. Royal palms began to die all over the island. Coconuts began to die all over the island. We didn't have to really worry about the coconuts from a native standpoint because they're not supposed to be here anyway. But the royal palms are native here. So why were they dying out? Well, they died out quickly where they were not supposed to be. Now, probably when Europeans first got here, there were royal palms well into the east part of the island. As the clearance and drying began to set in, they began to be more restricted to the western half of the island where they are today. This is planted in Shoys, so just east of, of Christiansted, a little too dry for a drought like this. When this horrendous drought set in, it killed those trees. So as the island continues to dry, we run into situations where plants are no longer even able to survive where they are. I'll give you an example of a plant that we have in the botanical garden called the desert cassia. This beautiful little pea shrub, gorgeous little weeping plant, blooms all year with gorgeous yellow flowers, just a gorgeous thing. And it's really native around the Haypenny Road area on the island. And most years, it's too darn dry for the seedlings to survive. The seeds sprout, but then they dry up. Where we have them in the Botanic Garden, because we're the western half of the island where it's moister, the seedlings do just great. In fact, we mow them down on the lawn. Now, we do grow them, of course, in the nursery. But there's a plant where somebody's going to have to move this plant because now that part of the island is no longer amenable to its survival. We're going to need to plant it elsewhere on the island. So like the rest of the world, in a microcosm, we're facing having to move plants and we're have facing how do we stop the drying of the island? What can we do to, to do that? 
So here is an endangered species, a gorgeous species. Uh, we have it in our collection, and our Virgin Island Rare Plant Initiative is working with this to try to reproduce it and, and propagate it. Uh, this is Eggers coral tree, which is found, the biggest population is actually found uh, in the Caneo Bay property uh, on St. John. It occurs in a few other tiny isolated habitats. The plant is threatened by many things, amongst, amongst which, of course, is just the, the cutting down of vegetation, but also um, everything from wild donkeys to an introduced wasp, which causes deformities and eventually causes the plants to die back. So this is a plant that needs our help. So we have to become the stewards of this. So going forward, we have to be growing these plants and distributing these plants. So I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but I want you to think about that forest of Tantan. We're going to talk about it in a second. So this is a, a house uh, right after having been built, just a little bit after being built, uh, at the east end of the island. Um, and the problem is they want to create a, a forest that includes native plants. Now, has everybody seen what's left after, after you strip a site and uh, you build a house? You have a desert. It is dry, rock, wind, sun. You try to plant something in there, and there is a challenge. But you know, nature has a solution. And herein lies our future, I think, is what I refer to as successional gardening. Let's say we went back to early St. Croix and a hurricane came through. And then nobody's living here. But trees would be knocked down. Sun would come through. What would happen? What would happen would be quick growing species that are adapted to seal up the forest and nurture the longer lived, more mature forest trees would grow and nurture those trees underneath them. So here, what you see growing behind the wall here um, are Cecropia trees. These are trumpet trees, Cecropia trees, from the western part of St. Croix. This is Cecropia shiberiana, a native species, that does just what we talked about. And I'm going to illustrate this point, and it makes this wonderful nurturing shade that will take care of all those problems we just talked about. Too much sun, too much wind, too much drying, too, too little moisture retention, too little organics in the soil. This thing grows incredibly fast and, and makes that perfect nurturing shade. Now watch the next slide, which is about three months later. So watch the wall and the plants. Three months. Now, clearly in the eastern part of the island, this plant isn't supposed to exist. Because e even without a new house site, it's too dry for this species to live there today. Now maybe at one time it could have. But with irrigation, temporary irrigation, this was the result. And now the plant is doing what it's supposed to do. It is now changing that microclimate. So it may not be able to change the climate all over the island, but it's able to change the climate on, say, half an acre of the island, suddenly taking it from desert and skewing it to moisture forest. So in microclimates, we can have an effect and start pushing the balance back the other way. Here is behind those trees, in amongst those trees. And you can see, and again, I would have to say, and when I co-founded a botanic garden in Ohio, this was one of the main messages we wanted to talk about, because we wanted to talk about natives and getting people to plant natives, is you don't have to eliminate some of your favorite plants. All we would say to you is, please put lots of natives in with the exotic plants that you want to grow. So as an example here, you can see the great big split leaf philodendron, the monsteras here from Central America. They're clearly not native. However, here we have this plant in the cage is good old uh, turpentine tree, tourist tree, whatever you wish to call it. Uh, here is yellow prickle. Here is one of the Eugenias. This is one of our lovely fragrant ones, and I mean that in a musky sort of way. And in the background up above here, you can see our white cedar. And also there's a palm back here, which is a royal palm. And of course, the bigger trees are the trumpet trees I talked about that are making this possible. Suddenly, they've made it moist. And they're dropping all those leaves that are decomposing and changing the soil in, into what it needs to be. And these natives are now being nurtured under those trees. And they're going to grow up and be a forest in this place. Yes, there'll be a bromeliad here, and there'll be a, a Mexican plant here. But the point is, a lot of native habitat is happening. So, I'm encouraging people to think about building our way out of what we have tried so hard to build our way into. And here, lo and behold, 
is a baby Cecropia tree growing in that same spot where I just showed you, the little seedling. Now why do I show that? I show that to prove that that local environment has been transformed from a desert into what is now a moist enough forest that even seedlings of that species on their own can get started without any human help. So that we can do these things, and I want to talk about um, that tantan group that we saw before. So here's the pod of the tantan tree. And it looked kind of hopeless when you see a tantan forest dominating the landscape, and you see all those horrible other invasives and that sort of thing. Well, I remember the difference between the islands. I have a friend on St. Thomas who has quite a few acres just above Charlemagne over there, had nothing but tantan on the side of his hill. But you walk under the tantan, and what was under it were beautiful regenerating native forest, huge diversity, wonderfully healthy. And this goes back to what Alassie was saying. The tantan itself has a few negative qualities. It has some chemical compounds that are a little bit off-putting to some plants getting going. But it actually does more nurturing than it does harm. It makes the nitrogen compounds from its roots, which help fertilize the soil. Remember the trees I just showed you. Tantan does the same thing. It louvers the light. It's a nurturing shade. It actually increases humidity, increases moisture. So this plant actually can also be used as a nurse plant. So if you already have an area of tantan, you actually are part of the way there. Why is it that our forests seem to stop at nothing but tantan, and his forest was filled with native plants? And the reason is because there's no seed source anywhere nearby for native plants. We were so thoroughly cleared that our natives are all stuck up on ridges and hilltops, or in very rare pockets, and there's no way for the seeds to get into the tantan. So our responsibility is to plant enough natives along the roadsides, in our yards, in our parks, then with enough diversity that we, our tantan forest, can begin to nurture a, a native forest which will take its place and push the balance back towards where it should be. So the power is in our hands to change climate locally and eventually, if we all do it together, on a much larger span. And eventually those guts may start flowing again. And we may have lusher growth down at the east end of the island. It won't be in our lifetime. But if we don't start doing it, then how is it ever going to happen? So I think we have to think in those terms. And I'm going to prove the point. Here is our native tire palm. It's much more common in the northern Virgin Islands than it is on St. Croix, but it serves to illustrate the point. These two are planted in a garden, but this garden happens to be right next to a tantan forest. And what do we see growing in the tantan forest? There's baby palms coming up in there. They will eventually grow right up through that forest, and they'll be there. And there are other natives in this tantan. So given enough time and a source, there has to be a source. So I just wanted to throw that out to you to think about that we can change things environmentally on the island for bad, but also for good. So now I'm going to open up to questions, and thank you for your attention. You've been very kind. <laughs>